morning, everyone. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in this morning. We're blessed to have you among us. Even though we can't see you, we know that you exist. And we're so thankful. We pray blessing. I wanted to read a verse that uh, it might be good to even memorize this. Um, pro, or, uh, Psalm 33. Where am I here? Psalm, thir- excuse me. Psalm 33, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people He chose for His inheritance. That's true of America. It's true of every nation that bows their knee to Him. And though we may be just a small remnant in the United States, we are a people who come to worship the Lord, especially in this season. All I can say is it's all hands on deck. We're going to worship God. He made Judah to be ahead of the army, to go out ahead, and Judah means praise, and that's exactly what we're going to do today. So we pray for the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit upon all of us today in Jesus' name, amen. I just see faith arising. Faith is arising. I want you to remember the times in your life God has been faithful. Remember those moments He showed you a victory where He did a miracle. Bring that to your heart right now and let faith arise. Let faith arise. Let faith arise. I believe I see it too in our care. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe I see it too in our care. I've seen you move, you move the mountains. And I believe I see it too in our care. long story short, Zerubbabel, you don't have to be seated, Zerubbabel were the first group. He was uh, the rightful king of Israel, but they were no longer a kingdom. Zechariah 4, a very famous verse. We're going to pray, right, in just a minute. I'll make it short. And he came back. He and the priest, Joshua, were called to restore. And Zechariah the prophet saw a vision of a menorah and he says, wow. And the angel said, what is this? He goes, I don't know. He goes, oh, you don't know? No, I don't. So what is it? He said, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. 
And then the Lord says this, Who are you, O mountain, to stand before Zerubbabel? So I just want to take a moment. This is about an end time vision, really, of the church being built. And that what Zerubbabel does is he lays the cornerstone, the capstone, Jesus, which is the big problem in the church today. It's built on other things, but the teachings of Jesus and his apostles and prophets in Scripture. So I just want to pray. You can just pray quietly. We can pray in tongues or whatever you want to do. I'm going to pray because I kept waiting, you know. I thought, well, but Lord, this mountain in L.A., in Hollywood, that has hindering the rebirth, or I should say the new wineskin for the church in these coming days to be able to know what time it is like the sons of Issachar and to be able to recognize this is no time to be a civilian Christian but we are at war whether we know it or not we've been invaded whether we know it or not which I'll explain later however you're the one who said that your church your ecclesia the gates of hell wouldn't prevail against her so I want to pray in Jesus name for the mountain that may be in your life that's hindering you or the mountain in this city which I can tell you what it is really it's Jezebel and other spirits working against the church but quite frankly um, they were defeated at the cross so we pray right now Lord that the mountains of oppression of hindering people spirits of hindering discouragement Lord even our own lack of uh, prayer Lord we pray that all of that which has hindered us up to now would be removed that we could have a fresh commitment in our heart to report for duty like never before early morning prayer in our bed whatever before we go to bed at night when we get up in the morning begin to pray and break the power around us to create your purposes which you said it's heaven in our midst you said to pray until the kingdom of God comes and we pray for that today for a move of God in LA and Hollywood and Southern California Lord we thank you Lord as even in this day right now we're out here today praising you and we believe the mountains have to move in the name of Jesus Jenny just give me a quick gist come up here give us a quick gist you know a brief summary of what you were feeling when you said all that but give us a few like bullet points you know can you remember that yeah just to repeat I saw the big stone that is covering the place where Jesus was and then I saw it removed and I felt that scripture it was a declaration the stone be removed it was a declaration and then I saw the picture of a hammer coming on that stone because for some people I felt that acts like a big boulder it keeps us in that place of death and darkness and yet God says the stone is to be removed so I saw the hammer come on the stone another form not just the whole stone be removed but the hammer shattering the stone and so bits and pieces were beginning to be shattered it is a work of God and then I felt like a reminder and of course it's probably because I'm in the book of Revelation but I remember the crown of the Lord at the end of the age is a crown of triumph. That is the story. And we, I believe, are to walk in that place. But this reminded me because I felt something was coming from heaven down to shatter these stones, these blockages that we have felt. And so God, I believe, is wanting to break through. Well, thank you. Amen. Are you ready? Yeah. We're praising God. Thank him today. We're going to finish up. You have another song or two? Whatever. Yeah. Amen. Good morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me 
The promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Thank you, Lord. Just to clear this with me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, you're my living hope. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord.
Hallelujah. Yeah, here we are, 2020, having a blast. <laughs> oh, Leon. You know, would you, this is 1 Samuel 18, 45 and 46. I, I just uh, wanted to just mention this because of one particular word in there. When he gets it up, this is about David going before the uh, uh, giant. Goliath, famous, our little granddaughter's there, and she's always asking for that, but Pam preaches it anyway, she might probably will today, but uh, in a, uh, First Samuel, let me, can you get there, uh, yeah, perfect, 1745, David said to the Philistine, uh, you have come against me with a sword and a spear, there it is, okay, now watch this. But this, I got one word here. I want you to see it. David said to the Philistine, You have come against me with the sword and the spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. This is what I, I want, that last word. The God of the armies of Israel. And here, here's the, what I want. Whom you have defied. That word defied means Challenged. You've challenged God. Next verse. That's what's happening today in America. Marxism. Leadists trying to do that. This day, you've challenged the true and living God. Today, I? No. This day, who? The Lord will deliver you into my hands. The Lord will deliver you into my hands. David, here's the man who loved God. Rick Joyner said this. I didn't know this. He says, the only man, only person in the Bible who says, I love you, Lord. Uh, and he was man after God's own heart. But watch this. I will strike you down. Not only that, I'm going to cut your head off. <laughs> I mean, really. Can you add something? Mine's well, Pam. Whatever. No introduction, right? Uh. <laughs> no, see, the thing with Goliath was he came out for 40 days. Right, that's right. In the morning and the evening, and he taunted the armies. There we go. Nobody was fighting anybody. But the taunts, the mockery, the defiance, he said over and over again, I defy, this is where he blew it, the armies of Saul. No, 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 no. That's why David called him an uncircumcised Philistine. Oh, there you go. You don't have any covenant. He didn't even call him by his name. You're uncircumcised. You don't have a God. Whoa. That's awesome. So nothing was going on for 40 days, but Goliath shouting, it says, his defiance as usual. And he happened to do it when David had come to bring food from oh, his father oh. to the battlefield because he was a shepherd. He wasn't a soldier. He hadn't been trained. Had he? In secret. There you go. Secret. Just doing what God called him to do, obeying his father. Even his brother, when he shows up at the battle, says, What'd you do? Leave just those few sheep? So it's all taunting, all mocking. It said Saul and the entire army ran. I mean, didn't run. They were terrified. Here they did. It says they lined up. They lined up. Each had a mountain. There was a valley in between. They line up. The Israelites faced the Philistines. And the only one, well, they did a battle cry, it says, when they came out, the Israelites. The only one shouting was Goliath. He controlled them by his words. What's happening today? That's exactly what's happening today. The oh. enemy is shouting 
and defying God's values and his standards. For our nation. Yes. And our forefathers. Speaking against them as if they're all a bunch of idiots. We're not so, going to continue to be quiet, are we? No. no. So when Jenny talked about stones being broken today, shattered, I believe it's those stones that have been comprised of the words that have taunted us, shamed us, to, to, to mock makes what it does it's to ridicule by making you feel insignificant oh. stupid unimportant do you know what he said to david when david comes out i said it last week but it's worth saying again <clears throat> am i a dog that's what goliath said goliath says that you bring me a stick you're just a little boy you're a stick you're worthless you're nothing. That's exactly what the enemy has said to you over and over through circumstances, through others' mouths, through the, just the pounding of the enemy, but no longer because we are arising. That's what's happening in worship. We are, are being filled with the power of the Spirit, and we are arising. This is our hour. It's not Goliath's hour. Amen. You know, they don't get it. It's our time. Finally, really, there's a cause. Finally, the enemy is very apparent. Finally, things, the alarms are going off everywhere. We're all shocked. Anyway. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. Stop. So, Thank you very much. She's shattering. She will have her time in a few more minutes. <laughs> no, that's great, honey. It's a... Uh, you know, the big, the big thing is, is, is that the church needs to be led by warriors. Can I be real direct? We have political, we have all these different things going on. But uh, woe unto Muraz. You remember that? You're going to do it? Oh, well, I won't say about it. But uh, they won't come to the, to the battle. A lot of people have been conditioned to be civilians. Oh, it's just sovereign. God's going to take care of everything. And uh, no, he said, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. Oh, my gosh. But we have to know who it is. and We have to learn to be holy and pure so that uh, we don't give place to him. We'll um, receive the offering in just a few minutes. We're going to uh, put it up here for you. Those that have been giving online, thank you very, very, very much. Um, we appreciate that. I want to tell you that um, uh, Jeremiah Johnson, how many of you know who he is? Um, most of you. And uh, he, in my opinion, having been involved in the prophetic ministry, Pam and I, since about 82 or so, then in 88 when it was birthed in basically three places, we were involved with two of them, and uh, Christian International, Kansas City. And, um, but uh, this young man comes on the scene. I met him about a month and a half ago. And uh, he's 32 years old. And uh, when I started listening to him, I thought, oh, you know who he reminds me of, uh, which is unique in many cases today. He reminds me of the prophets in the Bible, which is what we're all supposed to be prophesying. And uh, <laughs> I was going to mention him. And um, yeah, you can, those of you that give online and text, they say that texting works good for you. And uh, but anyway, he, um, he's coming September 11th. Does anybody remember that day? 9-11. He's coming on 9-11. Now, just so you know, because he's a family man, he wants to leave Sunday morning. And if he can get a flight out, he probably leaves Saturday because he wants to be with his wife and kids. How about that? So he's coming Thursday, Friday night. We're going to have registration. You'll hear more about it by Wednesday. And, uh, but it's Thursday and Friday, September 11, which I don't think you'll forget, and September 12. It's pretty amazing that God would send him to us, a small church and so forth. He, uh, anyway, um, but he's coming. He, has, he had over 500 invitations. It's the same thing, honey. It reminds me back when we were with Che and Lou uh, in 94, 95, all the way up until 2001. We were there. And, uh, but John Arnott had over 500 inter, uh, uh, 
invitations, and he ended up coming to Mott Auditorium. Any of you ever go to Mott Auditorium? A few of you, yeah. And, uh, and that, you know, something happened there. But anyway, Jeremiah is really, um, I believe he's a, a true sign. And uh, along those lines, I just want to say that I didn't listen to all of it, but I was very thankful for Cindy Jacobs for inviting and interviewing uh, Dana Cover, uh, Coverstone. I was really thankful. Uh, it's not like he needs more uh, people to know about him. I think he's up to almost two million people that are following him, or at least that have seen what he believes in. There's a few that say he's a prophet of doom, but he, he just said, hey, I just gave a warning. You know, people talk about prophetic protocol. Uh, in the scriptures, it says if a prophet, it's Old Testament, I think it's uh, Jeremiah 23, I think. It says if a prophet has a dream or a vision, let him tell it. That's all the poor guy did. And, uh, but it was historically, in all of our times, in the last 40-some years, we've never seen anyone, anybody prophesy specifics that came to pass almost immediately, you know, within three months. So praise God for Cindy. I appreciate that and uh, hopefully helping some of the prophets get on board to what we believe the Holy Spirit is saying. So we'll pray over the offering. Some people give checks and cash in the envelopes here. So Lord, I want to thank you for the provision of your children, that we're here today because of people giving, and uh, I thank you for watching over them, watching over us, and causing your name alone to be glorified in what we say and do today, and for you to give information, direct information, as to your plans for the United States of America in the uh, beginning stages uh, of chaos and civil war, that you would truly awaken us in Jesus' name, and we thank you for it. If you're writing a check, you probably know you can write it to TGP for short. That's the gathering place for short. And uh, I really do appreciate those online and others who have been giving. And uh, thank you in Jesus' name. So in just a minute, the uh, guys and gals will um, receive it. I, um, I want to mention to you, can you go to second? Did I give you Second Corinthians 10, 4 through 5? I didn't? No, okay. I'll, uh, if you can go there, sorry. Um, I want to tell you how America has been invaded. You know, Cindy Jacobs and others, Cindy did about, she said 10 years ago, but I, I think it was much longer than that when she talked about uh, an invasion of foreign armies if an America didn't repent. And others that we know of saw things like this in the 70s and 60s, or in the 80s and so forth. But I want to tell you that America was invaded in the 60s ideologically. And um, I'm going to read for you the little definition of um, an ideology. It's ideas, beliefs that shape culture and societies and nations and create values. Okay, that's an ideology. Well, this is what Paul said. So I want to tell you some of the major ideologies that we're at war with. Now, when me, most people, if I said we were invaded, uh, you would say, well, by who? You know, China, yes, they, they've invaded us long ago. And I'll explain that. But we've been invaded through ideologies, okay? Um, an ide you know what? I, I, I'm going to ask Siri because I want to quote it exactly. <laughs> what does euphemism mean? I, I really felt... Uh, euphemism means. Yes, thank you. Do you want to tell everybody? Word or okay, so here she is. Considered to be too harsh or blunt. Yeah. To something unpleasant or embarrassing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> A euphemism. I know that, but I want to read it myself if, you, if it's okay. <laughs> a mild or indirect word or expression substituted for one considered to be too harsh or blunt when referring to something unpleasant, terrible, or embarrassing. Let me tell you one of the major euphemisms of today is women's rights. Women's rights. Sounds good to me. Yes, and we're going to kill babies, painfully so. The mother's not going to feel it, but the child will be killed and torn apart. That's what's happening. So euphemism is one. Marxism is another. Socialism. 
We're reaping what we've sown because in the universities since at least the 70s or 80s, uh, Marxists have been teaching the students. And uh, Marxism is a failed concept. It's going to fail here. But Marxism, you know, it's interesting, the mayor of Seattle, she went down, and I think Wheeler did also in whatever city he was in, Portland or Seattle, went down and got with those folks, right? And she was there, you know, summer of love kind of turned sour for her. And so she said, I'm going down there. And when they, when they made up five things of what they wanted to be done, they wanted this, they wanted this, they wanted this. The fifth one was is for her to resign. And so what she didn't realize is Marxism is, lady, we don't even accept you or anybody in government. We plan on having our own. That's what Marxism is. It doesn't come in to, like, work with you. It comes in to destroy you. So hopefully she's going to get a clue. But the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, we have, they have divine power. Oh my gosh, it kind of reminds me of what you said, both of you ladies today. Okay, divine power. To do what? Uh, 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 they have the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And these are thoughts, opinions, ideologies, and so forth that are controlling, as it were, quote unquote, the narrative today. Okay? So, um, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Isn't this amazing? That when we are worshiping, this is what's going on. When we are praying in tongues, this is what's going on. When we begin to pray and cry out to God to destroy, demolish ideologies, Marxism and other things like that, Lord, break the power of uh, abortion in our nation, Lord. Bring conviction of sin to the conscience of America. Help people that are struggling, young girls that are afraid and ashamed and all that. We pray through all of that, but it's to destroy strongholds in people's minds. Even today when we were praying early about mountains and stuff like that, I felt like a sense of hopelessness was going to be destroyed. You know, that Jesus is our hope, not what you think is going to be your future. No, Jesus is your future. He's your God and you live in him. Okay, so uh, I appreciate Jenny had that fire on her today. I wanted to make it a little more clear as to what she was seeing. Uh, in 1968, um, no, 1962, uh, the Warren Court uh, agreed, and they get the Bible out of schools. That was a demonic thing. It was a misuse of our, and really, a misuse and an interpretation of the First Amendment and uh, freedom of speech and freedom of religion and so forth and so on. And, uh, but it was removed. And since then, I had a book years ago, David Barton put it out. I think it was put out in that late 80s or something, but it showed the literal, and he did this only by federal uh, statistics. It showed the everything going down with the kids' abilities and violence, troubles in the classroom going up. Um, the last person of our daughter, our youngest daughter, uh, who was going to PCC se several years ago, she said, Dad, there's some of our classes where it's so out of control. Two or three guys or girls or whatever, they can control the whole thing. The teacher can't hardly even teach. Now, when, of course, no one ever did that in a college class that I was in. I was in one, uh, or more than one, but University of Hawaii, there were about 800 people in the auditorium at the University of Hawaii, and no one ever yelled or interrupted the, the uh, guy. But uh, ask, ask teachers, we know teachers. Ask teachers down that work down in downtown L.A. how it is. And they can't discipline them. You know, God forbid. Listen, when I went to elementary school, if you messed around, you'd go see the principal, Dr. Mr. Durley. And you know what he had? He had a paddle. All the boys knew it. We never went in there, man. We never messed up. <laughs> Mr. Durley was a nice guy, but he had a paddle, you understand? It's against the law now, yeah. So we sowed it, reaped it, and so forth, and still are, you know. But so in 1962, they kicked God out of the schools. In 1973, we legalized abortion. Now, the legalization of abortion is an incredible thing. I was reading, 
In fact, I'll just read it. I didn't give it to you, but it's Numbers 35. I, uh, it it kind of makes me shake. But Pam and I were listening to Rick Joyner talk about, he, he was being interviewed by Tom and um, Marianne, who were in our church last September, and uh, part of Morningstar. So he was, they were asking him questions, and how far do you think we are into what you saw, which was uh, a civil, revolutionary civil war, and that, that he saw it. And uh, he said, well, I, I think we're there. Uh, we're starting to it for sure. He said, I didn't even know if I was going to live to see it because he says most things I prophesy, it takes 25 to 30 years. But he goes, this one's coming quickly because he had it in December of 2018. But anyway, this is what he said, and he quoted this from, uh, and I'm going to, he didn't do it perfectly. I, don't, I know I won't. But this is Abraham Lincoln, who was a president who knew why he was at war. And he said, oh, the offering. Yeah, go ahead, Rob, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah go ahead, sorry. And uh, so anyway, <laughs> he's holding that. And uh, so anyway, what happened was, is, is that Abraham Lincoln said, shall every drop of blood drawn by the lash have to be, as it were, answered by every, by, by drops of blood drawn by the sword. I didn't do a perfect translation of that. But he wondered how many young men would die on the battlefield because of the sin of slavery. Okay? And I, I've said it before, but it's quite moving. Pam and I were in Tennessee a few years ago, and we had the opportunity of going through. They took the boys' bodies, and they planted them in this one yard in this nice area there, a beautiful old home. And I, as I was walking through it, this is what they said. They, they were, you know, dead there. Their bones were there. And they were said, uh, we were caught up in something bigger than ourselves. The justice and judgment of God fell upon our generation. I knew exactly what they're saying to me. We had to pay for the sin. How is that? Well, I, I know this verse, so I knew exactly why they said that. Numbers uh, 35, verse 33. Do not pollute the land where you, where you are. Bloodshed pollutes the land. And atonement cannot be made for the land on which the blood has been shed, except by the blood of those who shed it. Now, when Rick Joyner talked about, he said how bloody this civil war could get, and he's hoping that we can make it much easier and pray and, 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 and you know, stand in the gap and all those things that we want to do and, are, and have been doing. Um, but when he said it, this verse came to me, and I would say for maybe 20 or 30 seconds, Pam and I were sitting there, I thought, whoa, this is penetrating me, you know, the seriousness of this. And then I, I read this verse uh, at that time. I went and read that verse, and this is what he said to me. I said, he said, I mean every word that I say, Rick. I mean every word that I say. So there's coming a real um, reckoning in these coming days. But I want to, uh, believe it or not, tell you some incredible things. This is our greatest hour because we are called, and God, Bob Jones said this years ago, he called it the sands of time. You heard this? Any of you heard this? Those of you that come here heard it. A few of you raise your hand. Bob Jones, you know, he was, he was wonderful. And um, he had this thing where he saw these men of God coming up. He named who they were. And they would put their hands in the sands of time and looked up to God. And they were grasping one of them said openly, God, give me 200 men and I'll turn the world upside down for your glory. Put his hand in there and he comes up empty. They all did. They all came up empty. So Bob, the Lord says, Bob, you go down there. Lord, I don't want to go down there. I saw what happened. Bob, you go down there. Put your hand in the sands of time. And he comes up with an old shoebox. And he opens it up and he sees all these conscription, or, you know, where you're uh, drafted, you know, draft papers, whatever, people's names on them. And uh, this is what the Lord said. Bob, I've reserved the best of the bloodlines to be alive at this time, and they will be my people. 
they will be willing in the day of my power. That happens to be you. Now, <clears throat> it's not all automatic. We have to fight the good fight. We have to learn how to live in God and so forth and abide in Jesus and be submitted to him is the whole thing, be under his authority. But God has called you and he wants to uh, use you mightily. I'll say a few other things about invasion and um, then I'll go to just a few verses. We've been invaded by drugs. Uh, Purdue, finally, Purdue um, uh, uh, Pharmaceuticals um, is being sued. They had to go into bankruptcy and so forth. But they attribute from 1999 until the present that over 450,000 people were killed by their drug, their opiate, that uh, it was a painkiller and so forth. But if you've ever seen anything about it, they had really, really strong guys uh, salesmen going to doctors, this will work, this will work, and basically sold a lot of them, uh, the bill of goods. But it, uh, 450,000 deaths have been attributed to the opioid uh, oxycotton that they, they produce, and they, they're in a struggle about it. Did I just go off? Yes. Okay, well, I can still, am I off, off, or should I? Just let me know what you want me to do. You want to go here? Yeah. Okay, fine. And uh, anyway, I'll take this off. In case the battery went out, or who knows? Doesn't bother me, does it? Yeah, looks like the. Okay, how about how about now? I just hit it. Is it on? Okay, fine. Maybe it. Maybe I hit it doing something. Anyway, um, we've been invaded. Uh, China uh, is working with Mexico, according to the Epoch Times, which I love. And I just looked at it today. I just got it yesterday. And uh, they're laundering billions of dollars, China is. We've been invaded. They've invaded our universities. They've stolen our technology. They're out against us. They've declared they're at war with us. There you go. So we've been invaded, but we are just waking up. Thank God for Donald Trump and especially Mike Pompeo. Can I hear an amen? amen. If you know anything about what's going on, that Mike Pompeo... <laughs> Man, he is a latter-day man of God in the political realm that is holy. Now, this, uh, it's blinking. Does that mean it's getting weak or something? Okay, well, anyway, I'll let you guys handle that, and I'll go on to the other one. But uh, anyway, I want to say, God Almighty, thank you for Mike Pompeo. In Jesus' name, thank you for a man of God, and man, he knows how to talk. Hurry up and just come up and just take that off, and you can have it. I, I'll just keep on going. But anyway, he, um, Mike Pompeo, stands up about it. Others are uh, bar during the uh, um, House, how they tried to mess with him. Even the liberal journalist said that was a complete failure. I mean, he was so calm, cool, and collected. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes. So anyway, I am... Um, want to mention, um, I want you to go to uh, Psalm 110. Thy people will be willing in the day of your power. That's who we are. This is our commission to encourage you along these lines because this is the, one of the big things God is doing today. And uh, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. People say Jesus is coming back soon. Not until that happens. That ain't ha if that ain't happening, he's not coming soon. Of course, we heard that since we got saved in the 70s. He's coming back any day now. Oh, yeah. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You know what that is? Listen carefully. Listen carefully. That is throne authority to his army. Throne authority. When they said to Jesus, or not they, when the centurion said, I can see you're a man under, under authority. Jesus said, oh, you understand faith. I only do what I see my father do. He's going to extend his authority, his scepter from heaven. Are you going to be ready to go in about three or four minutes? Okay, great. I'm going to go right through this. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. He's going to send it all the way down to earth to those who are willing in the day of his power, and they're going to rule and reign so that he can come back. That's what it says. Now watch this. Your troops, oh my gosh, your troops will be willing in the day of your battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you in the dew of the morning and the morning's womb and all that. There's an army that's being mobilized that God is going to use. It's called the church, a portion of the church, that's going to be, it's okay, I don't need to do that now. 
votes for her. And uh, anyway, I want to uh, just tell you three things that can bring healing to the United States of America. Number one is Joel 2, 15 through 18. We're going to have to have solemn assemblies, and I praise God. Uh, Morningstar is doing that in September. We're going to be doing it. We're already doing it because it's so solemn I can't stop weeping and crying and getting awakened in the morning and so forth. But uh, the Lord has sworn and will not repent you, our priest. Yeah, that's uh, Psalm 110. But uh, in Joel 2, uh, it talks about a solemn assembly. And it says, for the priests, the ministers, to weep between the porch and the altar. This is the kind of prayer we're going to eventually get to when you really see what's coming. I want to also mention um, Jeremiah. Uh, no, let's just, do you have Jeremiah 9.20? You do? Okay, well, Jeremiah 9.20 says, Call the wailing women. It says, Death has come into our doors. And so that's what Jeremiah called for, and he was the one that saw the invasion. He said, Get the wailing women out here. Joel saw an invasion. He said, Get the people to weep between the porch and the altar, right? And then in the days of, of, um, of uh, um, King Solomon, it said, If my people humble themselves and pray before me, I will heal their land. Those are the three things that we're calling you to because they heal nations, and you are called in the greatest hour of the church to be those who are on the cutting edge, to be those who are willing in the day of his power, and those kinds of prayers will be going on here on Sundays, and we're going to open up the church more for public prayer or for prayer for you, and all I can say is Pam is next, and praise the Lord. She got a new battery. That I, I didn't, you know, so she's going to be awesome. Can Amen. You, well, you were awesome. Oh, Thank was it? Oh, right. Thank you. Can you just, I'm trying to, can you hang that on the back there? I'm trying to think of a better way to wear this. Oh, okay. Let me see. See, can there's a help? belt. Oh, yeah, honey, I can do that. Yeah, okay. there's a belt. Yeah, that I can do. Praise God. <clears throat> okay. Or we can put it in the pocket here. No, no. If you want it in the back, I think that'll work. You know, it's so sweet. We've had our granddaughter, our little five-year-old, Ella Whitney, named after Richard Whitney. Ella Whitney, right, with us since Thursday. And she's five now. And we just have this little board book where she can open the, you know, which is great for a baby. But she still searched that out, found it in our stack of books, and uh, wanted it read every night to her, David and Goliath. Every single night, and I remember we went to Cancun with them a couple of years ago over Thanksgiving. It was the same thing. Mammy, she calls me Mammy. I'm a black slave from Gone with the Wind. <clears throat> That's probably not politically correct, but Mammy. Uh, Mammy, wh what did David do? What, what, what did he do after the stone hit him? He took his sword, the giant sword killed him. He fell face down and then cut off his head. Mammy, he cut off his head? <laughs> yep. And then we talk about what he did with it, how he carried it in. Anyway, she loves it. David became a great king uh, because he didn't take the mocking personally. Was David stronger than any of the soldiers? Well, in the physical. No. Was he better trained? Was he more experienced? No, we know the, all these, we know the answer. He was a boy. He didn't even have a sword. He had a sling. But the mocking, what did he say about the mocking? Instead of it frightening him, he said, how dare he defy the almighty God and the armies of the living God. And this is what he's training us. I tell you, there's a prophetic swirl around you guys. He's moving, he's stirring, he's awakening you. Woke up again 4.30 this morning, burning, burning, burning. Laying in bed, just burning. It's like, Lord, this is what we've waited for. This is what we've lived for. This I said last week, this is why you've this is what you've gone through hell for. Because he says again, I can only pour my, this kind of power 
through broken vessels that have learned to bow their knee. I think it's so interesting. They're taking a knee. I got on my knees. I was walking in the park yesterday morning. Got up early before Ella. Rick stayed home. I got to the park. The Lord's dealing with me. I'm on. I took a knee. It was like, Lord, I'm going to kneel for you, and no other. He's putting that inside us because my people will be willing in the day of my power. I think you said that last week, Bill. I remember that dream. It's time. Thank goodness. No more status quo. Dear God, Rick Joyner said, this is really good news. The enemy is showing himself. No more underhanded in the... I mean, it's like it was all under. Now it's defiance in your face. And you, this, you've been living for... You, this is what you're waiting for. Judges 5, Toby, if we could go there. Here's the deal. We've got to focus on the main thing right now. There's one thing we've got to do. We have got to pray for the elections. We only have three months left. Everything hinges on this. You're here. I'm preaching to the choir. I know it. But you've got men like, you know, not in a charismatic field like Dr. Dobson saying on charisma, if Trump isn't elected, it'll be cataclysmic. I mean, so many. I don't have to tell you. I'm not here. But let me just read you one verse that I never knew was in the Bible, and it's remarkable how I even got led there. I didn't give it to you, Toby. Let me just read it. Hosea 8.4. This is what the Lord said about Israel, what he didn't like. They set up kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. He says to me, Pam, you don't think I have an opinion about the elections? That's what some of the churches are preaching. He doesn't have an opinion. Are you kidding me? He removed Saul and put in David very violently. He is very opinionated and very clear in his opinions. He thinks he's ruling. Yeah, he thinks he's God. <laughs> the Ten Commandments are very clear. Everything's getting clear. You can feel that, can't you? Everything's crystallizing. This is what Rick Joyner said in the first page of the Harvest book. The lines will become clearer and clearer. The differences will become very apparent. There's never been a fight like there has with this election. You know it. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but it's good to hear it because this is what we have to focus on. We've got three months. I talked about boot camp. Joseph went into boot camp. What's the main thing that happened in boot camp? His life totally changed. It no longer mattered what he felt like doing or wanted to do or didn't want to do it. He had to obey and submit. And the Lord is calling us to prayer. He's called us, begged us. I'm the first to admit I have not been faithful, but that is not the point right now. The point is we have a chance to stand up and fight this fight. We got three months, that's it. So for Joseph, my son, who I talked about, our son, excuse me, who we've talked about. I've talked about him last week, how the Lord was galvanizing me. He gave me that word the morning Joseph left to fly to Fort Benning for boot camp. And I told you, galvanize means to prod out of a place of safety as if by electric shock. He said, I'm going to galvanize you. I'm a mom. I need comfort. I need peace. And I told you last week how 
Some terrible things happened to our soldiers that were captured, killed. It's all over the news. My son's just left. I think I was trying to get Rick upset about it too, but I ran out the front door into our front yard, which is pretty private. A blubbering, terrified terror gripping me that our son, my heart, was going to the very place of war. And he was a ranger, no less. Four months they'd go on. Constant missions, all by intelligence. This is how we're to fight. They didn't just go out and do a battle. They were led to specific places and homes by intelligence gathered by the United States of America. And they had planes overhead, and they only struck at night. He said they called us, was it the night warriors? It was something like that. Struck at night. They had night vision goggles. His goggles were $10,000 apiece. And they busted them all the time. Constantly night vision. That's what we're being given. Oof, they're priceless. Night goggles. To see in the dark. And to strike by intelligence from the living God given to us by the Holy Spirit. We're not batting the air. So I'm out in the front yard blubbering. I can't take this. You took my son four years. I can't live like this. And it became very apparent that I had a choice. Stand up and fight or live in fear. The same thing is being put before us. And if we don't pray now, it's the easiest it's going to be to pray right now. The birth pangs are going to increase. You know all this. I'm preaching to myself. You know all this. They're going to increase. So it's only going to get harder. And I'll tell you what happened. Okay, obviously, I fought. We fought. He showed us very slowly. I got into it. I knew what I was supposed to do, go into his room and pray. And we prayed together. We fasted one day every week. It was effortless. Four years. I can't seem to even fast half a day right now. Effortless. Because we're, I was in, we were empowered by the living God. And we fought for those rangers. And I'll just say it real quick. I'm a mom. We're, he's a dad. We were in the bedroom. I'm in the bedroom. He teaches me how to pray out of the Psalms. And I want to make it very clear. In the fighting came the comfort. In the fighting came the strength. In the fighting came the peace. In the fighting came my faith, growing, growing. In the fighting came scriptures that were unctioned by the Spirit. There were verses. I didn't have to stand on them. I knew they were true. And years later, we had the medic, who we had never met, come and visit us when Joe was living with us, and he said their battalion had the least casualties. I wish none of them had any casualties. And many of you fought with us. I put a news, I put a letter out, and I look back on those days, and thank God our son came back unharmed. Many didn't, don't. He, was, he had to come through some mental stuff. He's absolutely on fire for God. Clear as a bell. I lost my train of thought. But it was in the fighting. Oh, I look back. 
the most purposeful days of my life, the most energizing, because you live for a sense of purpose. We have been marginalized, we have been inconsequential, we have been irrelevant in this culture, but we are coming into the kingdom age where God's kingdom is going to be manifest. Rick's preached this for years. I didn't even see it. It's just starting to really dawn on me what's actually coming. But it's the elections. We have to, anyway, we have to fight. But I just want to say, I'm in my bedroom praying by myself. I have a Psalm 91 book that was given to me by somebody I can't remember. Uh, it was Psalm 91 for the military. And I'm thinking, this is incredible. Praying through Psalm 91, I prayed through the Psalms. There's so much in the Psalms about taking out his enemies, striking them. He didn't allow me to pray for any specific person being killed but bin Laden. I mean, he, stay out of that, Pam, but you can read the Psalms. Anyway, I don't even want to go into that story. I ended up meeting Betrayus in the Ranger graduation, and I wanted the books to go to the military. I'll just say it quickly. You've heard the story. I wanted the books to go. I'm at the Ranger graduation of our son. Joe, uh, Rick stays home with Laura because she's in high school. Mary and I, our oldest, go. We're at the Betrayus walks in, who at that time was General Betrayus over all the armed forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, the top general. He comes in to speak at Joe's graduation. He has no entourage. People are, we're outside in bleachers. People are running, or not running, but going down to take pictures with him. I always carried a Psalm 91 book with me. I had it. Mary looks at me and she goes, Mom, it's now or never. I'm like, no, I can't go down there. Mom, it's now or never. So I go down there, stand in line, we talk, I hand him the book, I say this would be great for our military, Mary snaps a picture of us, then I go home and I think, oh, you know, maybe it'd be good to notify the author that I just gave the book to General Betrayus, and he thanked me, and thanked us for our prayers. Anyway, long story short, I email the author who I've never met, met her later, never met her, and um, she contacts General Betrayus. He puts her in touch with the top chaplain over all the armed forces, and they ship over to Iraq. I know Iraq. I, I can't remember if it's Afghanistan, too. A hundred thousand copies of Psalm 91. Little mom starting out crying, whining, feeling sorry for herself. And in the fighting, become empowered. You know this, okay? Judges 5.9. So it's time to make a choice. What are we going to do about the elections? Does God have someone chosen to be elected. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What do we, th what the heck? What, anyway. So what are we, what are you going to do about it? That's what he asked me. What are you going to do? I had to commit to prayer. Because there were constant distractions. Pull them out, pull them out. Oh, it's kind of boring. Wasn't that great today? I think I'll skip next week. It's the showing up and being consistent that counts. It's not your excitement in prayer. It, you know what he said to me? It doesn't even matter if you like Trump, Pam. This isn't a personality contest, and I happen to actually love him in the spirit. Because a few of us, locally, 
gathered four years ago. Is it four years? Very, it's all local, so don't feel left out. It's just a local group of us, easy to get together. Monday mornings, we started in. The Lord dealt with us. 8 to 10 every Monday morning. It was so great because if I had been on my own, I wouldn't have showed up every Monday morning. So we need each other. So we have a little band. We pray. We prayed for four years. The revelation the Lord has released about President Trump. I mean, of course, it's being trumpeted by many. But the revelation, the tenacity, things just become clearer and clearer and clearer. And it has nothing to do with our opinions. Hosea 8.4, they set up kings without my consent. They choose princes, we could put in, that they like, that they can relate to, that talk the way they want their president to talk. Okay. No, he says, they choose princes without my approval. I think it's so incredible that he is demanding and he deserves. You know, he doesn't demand it. I take that back. He backs off. He'll let us stay busy. He'll let the other candidate be elected. We will get what we do. Judges. Did I ever say that? Judges 5. Oh, you got that up there. That's great. Judges 5. Toby, I keep saying it and then I don't go to it. Where is Judges? Okay. I don't know. We'll read it. Okay, Judges. Um, oh, yeah, no, I know where Judges is. Well, I'll just read it. That's good. Um, this is Deborah and uh, Barak talking about the tribe, the different tribes, and who basically were the ones who came out and fought and who were the ones that didn't, okay? My heart, this is Deborah, is with Israel's princes. Who are the princes? The willing volunteers among the people. Those that volunteer, that change their schedule. that make prayer a priority, whether it's on your own, I would definitely suggest getting in a group, joining our prayer groups. We have several in a week. We're going to have solemn assemblies at least by September. It's like all hands on deck. The focus is narrowing. That's what boot camp was. The focus narrows. The restraint narrows. The burden increases. The fire burns stronger. My heart's with the princes, the one that willingly volunteered among the people. Praise the Lord. Okay, and that, was that nine? Okay, can you go to 15 then? Thank you, Toby, you got it. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak. They were the ones that searched the scriptures and knew what Israel ought to do. They sent under his command into the valley. Okay, here we go. Here's what some of the other guys did. In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. We can keep going. Why did you stay among the sheep pens? To hear the whistling for the flocks. Why'd you stay home? Why'd you stay doing what you normally do? Why didn't you hear the Lord calling? In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Oh, that sounds so good. But they searched, they were searching their hearts because they didn't come in the day of battle. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did he linger by the ships? 
Why did he just keep doing? This is, these are representative of tribes of people. Why did they just keep doing what they normally were doing when there was a battle? Asher remained on the coast and stayed, what's it say? In his coves. So by the mercy of God, he is shocking us, prodding us, awakening us, dealing with us. Curse, which you started to give, morose, said the angel of the curse its people bitterly because they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord against the mighty. They didn't come, get this, to help. The Lord needs your help. This is staggering. Almighty God, Toby, can you go to Psalm 78, 8? Oh, no, yeah, this is so good. No, we can't, we can't finish. 31, yes. This is how, it, look at this. So may all your enemies perish, Lord, but may all who love you be like the sun when it rises in its strength. That's your promise. You want to be like the sun who rises in its, who gains strength as it rises up? Do you know what he said to me? Stand up on your feet. That's what he said to Paul after he knocked him off the horse on the road to Damascus. Stand up on your feet, Paul. That's what the Lord's saying to your spirit. Stand up on your feet. That's why he prods, he prods us. What mercy! Turns our greatest fear into fuel. Stand up on your feet and fight. It's in the fighting we get free. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm a mom. I'm, I, can't, I can't do this. No, 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 I, no, this is horrible. No, you, I mean, it was gripping me. Oh, yes, you will, Pam, because I'm merciful. And I'm galvanizing you. Okay, you know what? Oh, thank you. Okay, this is Psalm 78. This is staggering. They didn't come out to help. Who? Could you say it? Who were they helping? The Lord, the last verse I read. They didn't come out to help the Lord. This is like, Pam, wake up. I've tied myself to you. I've bound myself. I'm the head. You're the body. What fights? The hands, the feet, the head gives directions, the body fights. I can't fight and I can't get elected who I want elected if my people do not stand up. I mean, three months, it's time. I feel like the Lord says, that's the last three centimeters that a woman has to dilate. Seven to ten. And they're the worst. Every woman, they'll, they'll tell you, it's print, you read about it, it's printed. They want you prepared for it. You will want to get off the table. I'm not having this baby. I'm done. Oh, no, you're not. We're in the seven to ten centimeters. And then you push. And then new life comes. Then change comes. Then empowerment comes. Then the woman, for, the mother forgets the pain. For the joy. Ooh. Doesn't the Lord deserve our all? Ooh. Ooh. Dying on the cross, beaten beyond recognition. Was that halfway? I want to help the Lord. He actually needs your help. This is what's so shocking. Me? Yes. 
you. This is Psalm 78, and then we'll, we'll quit. I've got more, but we'll do it next week. They would not be. Okay. Oh. Woo. Woo. I tell you, you're coming out, boy. Oh, he has so prepared you. He's mocked us one too many times. I tell you, we're supposed to be weak in ourselves. I don't want to paint some picture that isn't realistic. I've just come out of the worst two years of my life in this ministry. I hated this empty building. I got to the point where I could no longer even prophesy. So I don't want to paint some picture that I'm some big shot. You know, Peter blew it at the end. He denied the Lord. And the Lord came to him, restored him, put him back on his feet, and he was the main one in the early church until Paul stepped in. Then you got to hear more about Paul in Acts. Peter, who denies he knew Jesus to a servant girl. You've gone through hell. You've been mocked. Doesn't matter how weak you feel or how far you failed. That's so no man can boast. I can't boast in my faithfulness. I would have left if I could. But he happens to love you. He's prepared you for this. He wants to shine in his children. He could go shine without us. But he says, no, I'm going to shine in you. I'm going to so empower you that they're going to know it's not you, it's me. Come out of the worst two years. So don't sit there and think I'm any different. We're only anointed to teach, not to live life. There is no difference between your leadership and you. Oh, I hate that thing. That says we're somehow better. Such a lie. We're supposed to serve you. Do you understand that? We're here for you. <laughs> they would be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal. Loyal. They weren't loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. And there's going to be multitudes that fit that description. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. We have been so favored. You are so loved that he is so relentless with you. Okay, next one. What did I give you? Eight and nine? Thanks, Toby. Then men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. Does it say more? No? I think it says something else there. Okay. Okay. 
they did not keep God's covenant and refused to live by his law, his laws. Ten Commandments, thou shalt not. <laughs> oh, but if you've had a rough life and it's been tough, and believe me, I'm not, I'm not making fun, we've all had a rough life. But the excuses that mount up, they have to be shattered. Oh, we've had a rough life, so maybe, you know, that doesn't really apply to you. That's all about Satan's talk. He said it to Eve in the garden. Did he really say you couldn't eat of that? Is that what he really said? Did he really mean that? No, he just, no, he just doesn't want you to be like God. Why don't you eat it? It looks really good. Oh, it's so temporary, and it turns like rot in your stomach. Okay, one more verse. Uh, 56. Oh, sorry. Uh, Psalm 78, 56. Did I give you that, Toby? Okay. And then we'll wrap it. This is the same psalm, okay? They weren't loyal. They were disloyal. Their spirits were faithless. Without the Holy Spirit, we would be in the same boat. That's what I really... Uh, but they put God to the test. They, that's the Israelites, God's chosen people, and rebelled against the Most High. They did not keep his statutes like their ancestors there we are again they were disloyal Ooh. and faithless what's it say as unreliable as a faulty bow god couldn't depend on them he needed to depend on them but they were unreliable like a faulty bow. It works sometimes, doesn't work other times. So it's not dependable. You know what that word faulty? I looked it up. Faulty means? It means the trait of neglecting responsibilities, of being careless, of lacking in concern, of being slack. You're like a faulty bow. You're lukewarm. What did Jesus say? I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Okay, I've said enough. So, they angered him with their high places. They aroused his jealousy with their idols. When God heard them, he was furious, and he rejected Israel completely. We can stop there. He didn't like it. He didn't like that he couldn't depend on his people. So we have a choice. Do we report for duty? And I know you reported, many of you have reported for duty for years and years and years. So please, I'm just seeking to encourage us as well as lay out how serious this is. We don't want to be a faulty bow. It's very interesting he says faulty bow. That's a weapon. I need you as a weapon in my hands. That's what he's saying to us. Not a faulty bow, but a bow that I can depend on. A bow that gets up. A bow that makes that prayer meeting regardless. A bow that gathers with whoever they gather with. Your friends, our friends, our little motley crew on Monday mornings. So empowering, so encouraging. It's basically the highlight of our week, as well as the other prayer meetings. So we gather, we change our behavior, and we say, Lord, which you have asked him. It's nothing, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I hope you know I'm preaching to myself. We say, what do you want me to do about this election? What prayer meetings do you want me in? 
Can you imagine Joseph, our son in boot camp, saying to the drill sergeant, no, I don't want to do that. That was so amazing. In the, he would talk about the, he didn't say a lot, but he'd talk about it more afterwards. But he talked about uh, when one goofed, one didn't, couldn't make the push-ups, couldn't do what they were being told, then they all paid for it. Definitely an incentive. Okay. Want to pray? Okay. I've got my mic. Okay, we're going we're gonna to close the meetings with prayer. Okay. For the elections. Our, you know, uh, if you're new or you're, you're online, you're live streaming, you need to contact our office. Uh, and get on the uh, emails. We sent out two very important emails from a pastor, wonderful pastor, in uh, Thousand Oaks. They are openly standing up against the government and the Department of Health. They didn't choose it. God chose them. And he, we sent that out. Tremendous. Oh, what a pastor. Thousand Oaks Calvary Chapel. And then also sent out what John MacArthur has written about how we obey God, not Caesar. So good. Don't even agree with him about a lot of what he teaches. Doesn't matter, Pam. I can use who I want to use. Does he know the Bible? Yep, and yep. So he's against charismatics. Pray for him. That's what he tells me. Don't get mad, pray. So we're going to have more things happening, so it's critical you're getting the emails that we send out, okay? So I want to encourage you to sign up for that. I love you guys. And uh, Lord, we just want to uh, take these last few minutes and really ask, Lord, I ask for anyone that's uh, wavering, not sure, that you make it very clear of where prayer meetings, what you want us to commit to. It's definitely a weekly thing. I mean, it's not even a big deal. Call us. We thank you, Lord. We are praying for the elections. We are praying for President Trump. We are praying for your continued protection and favor over him. We are praying for your wisdom over he and his cabinet, his leadership around him, our beloved brother in the Lord, Mike Pence, our vice president. Lord, we pray more and more. You loose Mike Pence's voice. What an incredible example he is of a Christian, of a leader. And we speak blessing over he, over President Trump, over their families, over their children, that they will be kept safe. Yes, Psalm 91, no disaster would even come near them. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. The Gathering Place